Muses of Mythology is a spoiler-heavy podcast. That's an understatement. We're going to discuss not just the events of this book, but the Rydenverse as a whole, and really anything that we feel is relevant. You can find full spoiler warnings in the show notes. 32 below freezing. That's too cold. Like, at the moment, it's... It's, it's nice. 10 degrees. I don't know what you're on about, bro. Gloves, layer up. Ugh. No. I fuck, I fuck with the cold much more than I fuck with the heat. This shit I know, DJ. sucks. Because you can't ride a horse. Welcome to Muses of Mythology, a podcast where we explore how ancient myths become part of modern pop culture through the lens of Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. I'm your co-host and podcasting muse, Darian Smart. Joining me is my co-host and brother, DJ. How's everybody doing today? I am the muse of distress. 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 Yep. You ever feel it? That's me. Yes, all you the time. You ever read it? That's Constantly. me. Constantly. Actually, me. Every second of every day. Just a little distressed. Thanks, man. Well, that's me. All right. Well, let's just go muse around the garden a bit and get ourselves back in order. All right, DJ, today we are discussing a character who doesn't actually ever appear in the Percy Jackson books present Mm -hmm. or in a dream flashback. Mm -hmm. And that annoyed me. So I decided (laughs) I was going to break our rule and we were going to talk about Andromeda. Understandable. And we are doing so with a very special guest, a first time guest to Muses of Mythology. They weren't even here during our podcast wow. of Poseidon Days, so this is a big deal for us. We are breaking new ground, and we are incredibly honored today be, to be joined by one of the hosts of the Damn Snack Bar podcast. It's Katie. Hi. I will say, even though I wasn't here for Podcast of Poseidon, I have listened to every oh, episode. I appreciate so. it. What? I was there oh, in spirit. You were there. Thank yeah. you. That's so nice of you. So welcome. I've listened to everybody's. I don't have anything to do in the car. Yep, so that's same. what I yep, listen to. I listen to a lot. Yep. I, I know too much about your lives, my friend. Yeah. That you've never disclosed to me on the Discord. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Well, Katie, uh, why don't you tell listeners a little bit about why you selected Andromeda to be your episode? I don't have a reason. I just like to learn. <laughs> I do I, like wonderful, and I I know that there's not a lot about her, but I do mm-hmm. love that she is that damsel in distress trope, and I do love that we're going to get into that. I was very <laughs> yes. excited to see that on the show notes. Yep. I was like, yes, amazing. Yep. I feel very qualified to talk about that. I am a Disney Her- kid, so yes, yep. perfect. Yep. yep. Yep, that is the big thing about uh, Andromeda that I justified into giving her a full-length main feed episode and not just like mentioning her on a myth roundup one because. I thought like we will explore the damsel in distress trope and why it has become such a trope. Heck yeah. Uh, So first, there's not much. uh, Usually I ask, DJ, what do you know about Andromeda in the Percy Jackson books? But But she's not there. She's not there. (laughs) Yeah. It's just the Princess Andromeda cruise ship. Yeah. Is it supposed to be implied that she's the like masthead? Yes. I think it is supposed to be her like when she is chained up with the sea monster approaching. Amazing. How do we feel about this? That it's just I mean, not it's like gone into? Bad guys doing bad things. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the overall vibe of like as a choice calling the ship. Is it because it feels like it's only called the Princess Andromeda because Percy is the main character? Probably. As a little time. That's such a big Percy. part of like Percy's story. It doesn't make any sense that it wasn't ever talked about. Yeah. It it is, it's a ch- it's a choice for Percy to be named after Perseus, but yeah, we don't have. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's like referenced a little bit when he's looking at the masthead of the Princess Andromeda, but it's never like he swooped in and saved her with Medusa's head. Like Medusa, we get more about Medusa and Perseus than we do Princess Andromeda and Perseus. Yeah, mm. yeah, which actually makes sense in terms of like. Greek storytelling, uh, but I don't think that was intentional. I think that was happenstance, and I will talk about that a little bit later. So for now, Katie, would you like to tell us a little bit about who Princess Andromeda is in terms of mythology? And if you don't want to do it, that's okay. I can do that. (laughs) No, that's okay. The only things that I like know off the top of my head about her from way back like three years ago when we covered her on our podcast Uh is that she was a princess and either she said she was more beautiful than someone or her parents said she was more beautiful than someone and Poseidon was like, "Mm, no. And so like plagued their like kingdom with like floods and stuff. And so then her parents 
were like, okay, well, we'll just sacrifice you to Poseidon then because we don't want to drink seawater anymore. And so then they changed it to a cliffside and then, you know, a monster came and tried to eat her and Perseus was like, you're kind of hot. I kind of want to maybe tap that so I'll save you. Yeah, that's all I really know. No, yeah, those those are the big beats for for more in-depth detail, because I really deep dived and got really excited about some facts I learned. We start our story in Ethiopia, which is an ancient civilization south of Egypt, also noted in the Iliad as being a popular vacation destination of the Olympians. Mm hmm. There's like one point in the Iliad where Thetis shows up to talk to the gods and they are all gone because they're all in Ethiopia. And then in the Odyssey, when Athena is able to finally convince the other Olympians like, hey, we need to help. You need to stop tormenting Odysseus and and we need to help him again. She's only able to do that because Poseidon isn't there because he's in Ethiopia, maybe punishing some kingdoms for a very vain queen. We don't know exactly the timeline there, but I found that very funny, actually. So, Princess is Andromeda. Her parents are King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia. And digging into Cassiopeia's history, there was a Greek poet, Nonus, who claimed that she was a nymph herself, and others claimed that she was just like a mortal daughter of some famous king. But either way, everyone agrees she had one big, big glaring flaw, and she was incredibly vain and arrogant. Actually, Katie, you mentioned that uh, it was like either the pair, like, Andromeda bragging about her beauty or the parents bragging about her beauty. I always thought that it was Cassiopeia bragging that her daughter was more beautiful, but it's it wasn't. It was Cassiopeia herself boasting oh. about this. Yeah. Real oh, nice. okay. So really Andromeda was just punished for nothing then. For nothing. She was just there. She couldn't help her mom. I think I that's love a how history oh. treats women. Yeah. I love it. Mm-hmm. So one day Cassiopeia just boasts that she's beautiful than all of the Nereids who were, you know, 50 sea nymphs, all of which were the daughters of the old man of the sea, Nereus. And and you can't do that if you're if you're a mortal living in ancient Greece. Like, mm-hmm. you, you can't ever compare yourself to any sort of, like, immortal divine thing related to the gods. That's just, you don't want to do that. Because Poseidon took her claim very personally. Yeah, that he did. Yeah, uh, Kitty said he floods the coastlines and then also sends the sea monster Cetus to, or Cetus, I think, to just start wrecking shop. And it was interesting because when I was looking up a lot of the myths, the word like Cetus is always capitalized as if like this was the name of the specific monster. But when I actually looked into the creature itself, it was more like, oh no, this is just like the word that would be used to describe like a species of serpentine sea monster. So it's not like this was a specific monster, like a chimera or something, the chimera. It was just a sea monster. Don't worry. Oh, about I always it. thought it was just the one. Yeah, yeah. No, I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah, it's just like any fishy serpentine sea monster would be called Cetus or Orchidus, or Kidai for plural. Mm-hmm. So as you do, when you're living in an ancient Greek story and your wife has done something to piss off the gods and now a monster is attacking your kingdom, the king goes to an oracle to ask what he needs to do and is told, well, you got to sacrifice Andromeda to the sea serpent. If that's what you got to do, and you really said, hate to see it. but you hate to see Because again, it's like, why Andromeda? Why not Cassiopeia? I don't know. Because they said it because yeah. Andromeda is younger. I don't know. We got to punish Cassiopeia for this. So Andromeda is going to take the fall. Yeah. So they take poor Andromeda. They strip her of all of her clothing. And then they chain her to a rock in the middle of the sea. And just leave her there until the sea monster is going to show up again and eat her. Like it's not enough to be chained to a rock. You have to be cold too. You have to be cold too. It's brutal. So there she is just probably wishing she had a better mom. I would assume when Perseus just zooms by on his winged sandals, having just slain a certain petrification enthusiast Gorgon. And he sees this frightened, naked young woman on a rock. And as you mentioned, Katie, he's like, kind of want to tap that. So he swings back by the palace or swings over to the palace. And he's like, hey, I will deal with your sea monster problem if you let me marry her. And the kings and the queen and like, sure, that sounds great. Go do that. It's not if he to save her or anything. It's just, you know, you got to get the formalities 
out of the mm-hmm. way first. Yeah. Perseus doubles back just in time for the giant sea serpent to be rising out of the ocean. And Roma has no idea what this fool is doing. Like, just this is just happening to her. He swoops down and cuts off its head with his magical sword. <laughs> now, you may be asking God, yourself. Fuck yeah. Perseus, you did just slay a certain famous Borgon with a pinch for petrification. Why didn't you use her head and just create a new open-air art uh, display in the harbor? It's an ice Nice story. new installation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It, it is a tourist harbor. destination. It could be. That's a tourist destination, yeah. <laughs> People come for yeah, miles. They need the harbor. There's this big fuck-off stone thing in the middle where the ship's going to go, you know? Sail around. Sail around. It's fine. You we'll too could pose in front of Ships cannot maneuver penis. that easily. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they'll go there and pose like Andromeda. Exactly. Tor, it, it would love it. No, the reason he doesn't use it is because he's actually going to have to use it later against Andromeda's uncle who's pissed off that Andromeda's going to marry Perseus because apparently she was promised to him. Okay. And it would be overkill to have Perseus use the head of Medusa on more than one enemy in this quest, obviously. So we got to mix it up. He uses the head of Medusa on the uncle and the uncle's allies. Then he and Andromeda skip town. They swing by, they pick up Perseus' mom because she was dealing with some stuff. This isn't Perseus' story. We're not going to get into that. And then they uh, go get to be... Where where is they? Yep, they go on to rule the kingdom of Tyrannus together, and then they had seven children. The only hero with a happy <laughs> ending. Yeah, but I actually don't know if that's true. I'm pretty sure Perseus ends up going to war against Dionysus. That's we'll cover that in Trials of Apollo. <laughs> they have, like I said, seven kids, including one son named Electrion, whose daughter Alcamene was be the mother of Heracles. Nice. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yep. And then one more thing for her. So she, Andromeda lives the rest of her life. Queen, nothing else really happens to her. And then upon her death, Athena takes her and puts her into the sky as a constellation, forever posed with her arms outstretched, replicating her moment of absolute terror when she was chained to the rocks waiting for the sea monster to come devour her. Because, you know, it's got to it's got to commemorate Perseus's bravery, which sounds exactly like something Athena would do based on what we know about her. It really just like, you know, I'm going to memorialize you in your most traumatic moment. Yeah, this is the worst, probably the worst moment of your entire life. Yeah, yeah. And that is Andromeda. Not much. Not much to not Andromeda. Much. No, not much to Andromeda. Uh, it is, I would say, she's not really an active player. Uh, we could, I believe, the uh, concept of the sexy lamp theory could be applied here, where you could just replace her with a very sexy lamp, and the story would kind of be exactly the same. Nice. It would. Yeah. It would. She doesn't seem to have a whole lot of agency in this um, no. story. Yeah, I think it, it, looks like it actually is kind of a bummer that she's not even the one that was doing the bragging to get punished. Yeah. But then I suppose if she had been bragging, then Perseus couldn't marry her because that's not good wife material for your Greek hero. Yeah. Is her age ever stated? No. Amazing. She's just a young princess. (laughs) We could assume... Of marrying age, though. Of marrying age, I was going to say. So like 11. 11, yeah. But then I was thinking about how her uncle was pissed off because she was supposed to marry him. And the fact that she hadn't actually gotten around to marrying him yet suggests that maybe she wasn't of marrying age yet. Mm. Mm-hmm. Love that. We don't love it. <laughs> yeah. A little, yeah. little uh, mm-hmm. cringe. Mm-hmm. Just a tad. Just like a teensy, yeah. like maybe questionable. <laughs> yeah. So something I mentioned earlier about, so it's, it's Perseus's myth. Like it's, this is what happens to Andromeda, but it's just another chapter in like Perseus's story, which is part of the reason why Andromeda doesn't do much because she's not really a character here she's like the reward that perseus gets after he is like slain the gorgon right yeah but in ancient greece until about the fourth century bc uh it was really popular like when depicting stories of perseus the most popular scene was the scene of perseus slaying medusa like that was the big thing that's what you would see on all the art and then after that during like the roman era it was Perseus saving Andromeda that became a big like cultural icon. 
I think that reflects a lot about like the the cultural differences and what was resonating with stories. And also circling back to like, yeah, this could be the reason why we talk more about Medusa than Andromeda in the Greek book. Makes sense. That shift of the Romans being like, yeah, no, 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 no. We really like him saving Andromeda. That's that's what we like the best. That has really stuck around and would stick around through like the following of like Western art and, and storytelling because it's been a popular inspiration for artists through the centuries, especially mm. male artists who just like really like depicting this scene of a strong man saving a helpless, submissive woman. Yeah. For reasons, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do uh, like that the Romans must have like seen that scene of um, Andromeda and been like, it looks better that man saves woman from mm-hmm. monster rather than man commits horrible act of violence against woman. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that makes sense because that was around like Ovid was Roman. And so he was the one that added that tragic backstory to Medusa where she was like a woman who had been assaulted by Poseidon and then was cursed by Athena. Before that, she was just generic monster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like attributing this in like the Roman era would make sense as to like if that was more common, it'd be more interesting to be like, "Uh, I don't know if I want to do the Perseus thing, uh, but I like him saving Andromeda. Let's talk about that instead. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. There's a, um artist on Instagram, I don't remember his name, it's like Tyler something, and he mm-hmm. does like carousels of, you know, different myths, and so he does like eight to ten drawings of each one, and he did one Yes, of, I follow this person, yeah, yeah their work He did one lovely. of like Perseus' story, and the, the artwork of him saving Andromeda is so much better than the one against Medusa, so I fully understand why the Romans mm-hmm. were like, hmm, we like this one more. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's just more dynamic. <laughs> So yeah. dynamic, yeah. Uh, it also is more heroic because in the Medusa myth, like traditionally Perseus doesn't actually do, I mean, he's there, he kills her, but he like, he's told to look away by Athena and Hermes is the one that directs his sword to kill Medusa. So he's not like active, unlike with the Andromeda story where he's the one that sees, oh, Andromeda, he's the one that's like, hey, I want to marry her. He's the one that kills the monster. Like he doesn't have like divine godly help. With this yeah. situation, it's all him. And I can see the Romans being very into that. Yeah. We will definitely link to that artist in the show notes. There are listeners, so you can check it out because it's they do astounding work. And yeah, I've, I know the the Andromeda scene you're, you're talking about. And yeah, it's striking. It's very good. So uh, something I thought was really cool. It, oh, cool. Interesting. It is how, like the like I said, the popularity of the Medusa, not Medusa, specifically not Medusa, Andromeda and Perseus continued on through the ages. And in the Middle Ages, artists would start to incorporate like other cultural iconography in this story because it is very similar to like other stories of like the, the great heroes slaying a monster, saving a princess, the damsel in distress trope. One thing you started to see a lot was the hero on a horse. Like that was super common in, in Middle Ages art. Perseus Notably, didn't have a horse, had winged sandals, and was fighting a sea monster. So this is when you start seeing Perseus just be put on Pegasus instead of, you know, anything else to have to like hold on to that popular iconography of the time of the knight on horseback. Mm -hmm. So we just just take Perseus from Bellerophon, because who cares about this guy anyway, and just give him to Perseus, who is more popular to begin with. I feel like the use of Pegasus is just like an extra kick in the teeth for Medusa because isn't Pegasus Medusa's son? Yes. Yes, he is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just like, I killed your mom and you're going to be my like, <laughs> and now horse you're forever. My horse. Yeah, now you're my horse friend. And uh, listeners keeping track, that does tie the loop on that Pegasus thing and Percy's thing I mentioned from our last episode. I kept my promise. I mean, to be fair to Pegasus, chances are he didn't like his mom. Most people in mythology seem to not like their parents. Well, Perseus specifically does really like his mom. He's doing well, all Perse- of this to save his Perse- mom. Is an, Perseus is an exception, clearly. Because, <laughs> once again, the only hero to get a happy ending. <laughs> I don't really think Pegasus or his brother would have even really met Medusa. They would have just, like woken up oh my god there's a dead body next to us yeah for real we didn't really dive into that in the last episode but yeah there's pegasus who probably immediately flies off because he's got wings so right not but his brother is just a guy so he'd just be standing there like um what 
and humans take way longer to learn to walk than a horse does. So like oh, yeah. Pegasus would have been like long gone. Because humans got the time. They can they can take their time hey. to actually learn to walk. Horses, they got to be on the move quick. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I was picturing them like springing up from the earth, like the blood in the earth or like from Medusa's neck, like fully adult. It didn't occur to me that maybe this was a fowl <laughs> and a baby human that just crawled out. <laughs> and that's so much. I'm so... That's so much more upsetting. <laughs> oh, no. I feel like there's a reason you never hear about the other brother because they just would have, like, way too much trauma. They probably yeah. just have nothing going for them. No. He got married, had a kid, didn't do anything else. And, you know, good, yeah. good for him, honestly. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, that's when you started seeing Pegasus really paired with Perseus, specifically to mimic, like, the, like, Sir George stories of him slaying the dragon from horseback, like those kind of things. And all that's very cool. If if you're a, a horse girl of any gender, obviously that's probably your jam. I'm not. Katie, you're a horse girl? Terrified of horses. Yeah. Terrified. Yeah, I find them very intimidating. DJ, I have told horse this girl? story. No, not Hold at on. all. What's oh, the I was story? just going to say, I've told this story <laughs> on my podcast multiple times. My mm-hmm. family took like us horse riding as like a, you know, summer like activity whatever uh-huh. and I had to get on a horse they were all like x race horses so they were supposed to be very gentle very like good for like first timers yeah and so I got put on this horse called Mr Nibbles and I was like okay well this sounds like adorable this will be fine and we went on like this off trail like little hikey thing mm-hmm. turns out my horse is named Mr Nibbles because he takes fucking bites out of all the other horses ah! so I was at the back of the line my horse fucking took a chomp out of my brother's horse's ass and then my horse like reared back because it like kicked and I almost fell off. Never going near a horse ever again. It was a terrifying that's, experience. That's how Scarlett O'Hara's daughter died. Like, wow. <laughs> it's terrifying. And you're also just like up so high. You have no control. Like it's so much stronger than you. Absolutely not. I'm not a horse girl. The most yeah, that I could no. do would be like to look at one through a fence. Yes, through a fence. Or a door. Fence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A picture, a photograph of a horse. <laughs> yeah, preferred yeah, if you, yeah, if you will, absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think I have ridden a horse one time. There's family in Texas that had horses, and I would prefer not to do it again. I'd ride a horse if I was if I was uh, wasn't so heavy. Yeah, DJ's a big dude. This is a big. D- we'll get you a big horse. What's one of the ones that the beer? <laughs> Those are big fuck off horses. I don't think yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> The horse is like as big as an F-150. I'd rather the F-150. Thank you. I would happily like ride in like a horse-drawn carriage. Yeah, Or like a chariot oh, yeah, situation. Definitely. Yeah. Very charming. On a snow. How do I get my girlfriend to agree to go on a snow-drawn, horse-drawn carriage with me in the winter through downtown Just Boise? surprise her with it. Doesn't even matter. You just, yeah, you just buy the ticket. Just buy the yeah, tickets yeah, yeah. and be like, hey. like, hey, hey, I got a thing for us. Let's go downtown. And then suddenly, well, what is this horse drawn carriage doing here? Yeah, it's so romantic. She listens to the podcast, so she's immediately going to hear about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but maybe I'll cut it so it's only for the patrons. <laughs> so She doesn't pay for that? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> she only just started following the podcast on Instagram last night. I love that. I love her that. Defense, she didn't <sighs> realize she wasn't. but <laughs> That's fair. So bringing us back to the topic of Indra- poor Andromeda. Wow, we spent more time talking about Pegasus and horses. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm hesitant to make this claim because I don't have quite enough evidence to support it. I am not Emily of Monster Donut. Unfortunately, I am not a classic scholar. But I believe this is likely one of the earliest surviving examples of the damsel in distress trope in Western storytelling. Because while I was researching this, it occurred to me that you rescuing, find one I couldn't really find others in like Greek mythology, right? Like, or mm-hmm. in like Egyptian stuff or in Norse stuff. Like, rescuing a princess, a maiden from a monster is just not a common, like, inciting incident for these ancient stories. Like, it's, it's usually there's a monster terrorizing a town. So the, 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 the hero is going to go deal with that problem or it needs to be honor or they're trying to regain their glory or they're trying to make up for past mistakes or they're trying to reclaim their throne or they're just going to war. Like, there are a bunch of other reasons that these heroes do what they do. And it's not usually because there's just some helpless lady. And I, mm. I thought that was really interesting. 
I know that Norse mythology have a few, but yeah. that's more just like Sif was kidnapped and so they had to go and like rescue her uh, mm-hmm. more than once. And yeah. I think this, yes. yeah, I think it was the same for Freya and like mostly it was just like a giant or someone was like, I want to marry that goddess and you won't let me, so I'll just kidnap her until it happens. And mm-hmm. then, but then they like come back and save her in time so that it doesn't happen because she's portrayed to someone else or is already married to Thor. Mm, yeah, to Thor so, usually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, usually to Thor. That's the only I, one I can think of though. No, that's a good example. I wonder, and I, I this is just me totally speaking out of the air. Like I, have, I don't have enough knowledge to know, but I do know that the stories we have from Norse mythology are the written down like the the Eddas, they are written by like Christian monks. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Because they were all like oral storytelling traditions. So all of that like is done through the lens of Christianity. And also like these medieval monks from a time when, you know, as we're talking about, Perseus saving the damsel was super popular. The idea of the damsel in distress was up. There's a reason she's called the a damsel. A well-established. It's, it's a well-established. Yeah. So I would wonder not that you're incorrect but i would wonder if there was an influence there and there's a reason those stories were like oh we have to save this like woman and protect her chastity and protect her from this if maybe there was like could it have been that maybe those stories had other versions where they were doing going up against this giant for other reasons yeah no that's definitely true i oh, know yep. i just i just said not because that's something we're gonna have to tackle a lot when we cover the Magnus Chase books and all the Norse myths is like examining like, Oh, well, this is the version we have, but was it like, was it? And this yeah. is just the first time that's come up. So it's Katie. Thank you so much for giving us that opportunity. Oh, that's fine. When we did Magnus on our podcast, like Joe didn't know anything about anything and neither did I, I was just really, like <laughs> learning stuff. And so like after the first like book, it definitely got to a point where we were like, so this is what we have, but then Christianity fucked it. So this is what we have now. Yeah. And she was like, Oh, we love that. Cause both of us have <laughs> so much religious trauma. So we were like, Oh, hey! this is great. Yeah. I think, I think we're just in the very first episode, we'll just have to do a disclaimer of like, this is the deal. This is what we know. We're just going to have to go through it. So we don't have to, it's going to get boring to hear us mention it in every episode. Yeah. When we talk yeah. about the myth. So, just, just gets to a point where it's like, oh, Christians thought this was the devil and this represented hell, so that's what it is now. Great. Yeah. yeah. Here's the disclaimer. We're just going to use – this is what we got. This is what we're going to work with. Everything's based off this anyway. We're going to move along. We're going to move along. We're going to move along. Yeah. But for this one, we've got the damsel in distress trope. Yes. And then the spinoff, the distressed dude. Oh, do you want to talk about dudes in the distress? I'm also into that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I just I was going through the damsel and stress TV trope to see if there's any that I recognize, and obviously there are. And mm-hmm. then I came across Attack on Titan. It's like subverted with Aaron in distressed dude. I'm like, oh word, and I started word, looking at that more. too. And it seems like the oldest distressed dude is in fact Osiris having to be saved by Isis after his brother Set kills him. Yeah, kind of hard to fight back when you're in a million pieces. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Seth's sure. the one who put him in that state. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So Isis had to get on. That's a good point. Yeah, I like that. The only, like, distressed dude that I can think of who's always needing help is, I don't know if you guys ever watched a Canadian cartoon called Class of the Titans. It's very, <laughs> very creepy. Like, that is, that is a deep well that we, Neil, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Neil, Neil I believe I it. Absolutely believe it. Neil is my favorite character in Class of the Titans. Like, yeah. that is a deep one. As he we should be. To on the Patreon yeah. As he should be. This is, I feel like this might be a little bit of a loaded question. Do we like the damsel and or dude in distress trope in storytelling? Yes. <laughs> I, I do. I like it a lot. I don't know. It's just. Cocktail napkin. Elaborate. <laughs> cocktail napkin. Elaborate. I mean, let's just say, let's, let's, let's look at the facts of this situation that we got, Darren. <laughs> I'm a guy, I'm attracted to girls, and I enjoy helping people. So, hey, guess what? If I'm a core audience member, I hope you appeal to that. So I do enjoy this. And, I mean, the distressed dude is just a fun take on the damsel in distress. It is. I, w- I will say, I do like that you included, you just like helping people. Yeah. I actually think that if it's framed as that, where this is being told to people who, like, it, like, Maybe Borderline have a hero complex. (laughs) Oh, in in games, 100%. Let me just shout out our dear friend of the pod, Rob. Whoa, why did I call him that? Let me shout out Robert (laughs) real quick to put them on blast. It's because whenever I say friend of the pod, I'm usually about to say Tim, and it's one syllable. So the idea of saying Robert, my brain was like, wrong. (laughs) 
I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, I will give you that. I will give you. Yeah. It is. There is something about the fantasy of getting to see the idea of like being the hero and saving folks. Yeah. Look, I'll say it's one of those tropes that I love to like read about and will like actively consume that kind of media. But mm-hmm. if somebody tried to put me in that position, I would be like, fuck right off. I can do it myself. Yes. So like, I- you know. One of those like escapist things where it's like, yes. I'm not a feminist when I read books. Yes. But otherwise. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm allowed to consume my problematic content. Leave exactly. Me alone. Exactly. I would never engage. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a difference. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. We can acknowledge that storytelling has an important place in culture and we learn a lot of things from stories. So if all of our stories are like this, then we have a problem. But if every now and then I want to read about a character being saved by their super hot love interest, like, yeah, why why not? Why can't I? And that's like like that. That's usually what it boils down to. Like, I'm a very much a romance reader. And so Mm -hmm. if I'm going to consume something that is going to have a happy ending or it's going to have two people find each other, I'm going to read it. So, you know. While the, like, she saved herself from the tower instead of waiting for him, while that's, like, fun, mm-hmm. I would rather read about the love interest. <laughs> yeah, right. If you save yourself from the tower, I'm probably not reading a romance story. If I'm reading a yeah. romance story, you could work yeah. together to get out of the tower. That's fine. But I yeah. do need to see that bonding. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> while, I, while I am here for, like, the badass, like, girl, like, yes, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to save myself. I don't need a man, like, whatever. While I do enjoy reading that, I would then love to see at the end of that story, a little caveat, she found someone. <laughs> yes, also that. like found All her hard work who, paid off. <laughs> it, it worked in the end, yeah. yes. And again, I love these stories. Not every single story should be this because that's troubling. No. There's plenty of people yeah. who have fulfilling, wonderful lives and do not need romantic love. Yeah. Exactly. But I like, I, I want it, it's flavored into my storytelling, please. Yeah. One of my favorite tropes of all time is character a is like being attacked or has been hurt in a fight or is in trouble whatever and character love interest b swoops in and is like draws their like sword or uses magic or whatever and they're like no one touches her and i'm like yeah fuck very fuck. strong oh, damn. very good a lot of fun <laughs> what's the page number for the last olympian here that you're talking about <laughs> no <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure she was actually thinking of Will with Nico in Tower of Nero. <laughs> Listen, shut the fuck up. I didn't ask to be called out by either of you in this moment, actually. And actually, I was talking about uh, Anubis Walt and Sadie Kane. <laughs> oh, there you go. I thought that was a problematic relationship, but I mean, okay. Yeah, I couldn't focus hey. too heavily on that one. Hey, listen, listen, listen. I'm an listen, she fantasy. was 12. I'm okay. She was 12 is the problem. I'm also an urban fantasy romance reader. So if you tell me the immortal hot boy is basically a 16 year old because of things, I'll be like, sure. Yeah, fuck it. Let's go. They can use magic. Why not? Let's run it. Let's keep she it going. Was I guess 12 is the problem. And yeah. that's not excusable. I don't understand why Sadie wasn't just like why Sadie and Carter weren't twins and they were both 14. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Here? Like 14, 15. Amazing. Not what this episode is about. We need to move on. <laughs> Someone get me out of here. <laughs> Call out too much. Let's talk damsel in distress. Do we need to define this trope? Probably not, but would someone like to for funsies? Uh, it's Princess Peach, right? She gets taken. Mario's got to got to save her. There's your damsel in distress. Some yeah. of the the earliest, I would argue, some of the earliest games really were just kind of that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Donkey Kong, like one of like probably people could pinpoint the mm-hmm. game. Yeah, Polina, or in the game, her name was just Lady at the time. Yeah. Then again, Mario's name was Jump Man. Yeah, Jump Man. <laughs> Donkey and Lady, Kong was fine. the only named person. So he's the real main character, is what you say. He's the real main. No. Yeah, that's why the second game was Donkey Kong Junior, and he was saving Donkey Kong from Mario. Mm, I like that. Uh, did you know Nintendo faced like pretty big legal trouble for calling that character Donkey Kong because King yeah. Kong? And yeah, and the 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 whatever or is it when I don't know if it was Universal at a time who like owned the rights to King Kong were like not jazzed about that. And so they had to hire, like, an American, like, legal attorney to, like, solve this problem for them. And he did. Like, he got like, to basically bro, be like, yeah, no, no, but... Like, who cares? Like, it, Kong's a fucking name. You can't... What, it... Yeah, I don't... I do not remember exactly what he did, but he did solve the problem for them. So they can continue calling the character Donkey Kong and everything is fine. Yeah. And Nintendo was so grateful that they did name a character after this attorney. And I'm going to find this... I know this man's last name, so let me find... <laughs> a very... 
This is a very popular character. You may have heard of him. Uh, this attorney's name, John Joseph Kirby Jr. Hell yeah. Very nice. Love it. That's great. I love it. I'm just glad it wasn't like a Waluigi. Right? Wouldn't that be wild? Oh, this man, man, that been this great. man's name for George Waluigi. <laughs> So Princess Peach. Yeah, that's a big one. Like Peach Zelda. Like I think those are probably two of my first introductions to like the damsel in distress mm-hmm. trope. Well, that's not true. Disney. Katie, do you yeah. want to Disney was also there? very big on it. Yeah. Oh, it's like their one trope. Yeah. Definitely. Like Aladdin, Sleeping Beauty, a little bit of Ariel, but not heaps, but like a little. Mm-hmm. You know, Rapunzel, definitely. Yeah. That's a yeah. big one. Mm-hmm. Heaps of them. Heaps of them. Heaps of it, yeah. So they're telling yeah. all those like old like fairy tales and folk tales. Oh my god, from... Nemo. <laughs> Nemo. Oh my god, Nemo. Yeah. That's a that's Nemo's a, a distressed a dude. Little, bo- yeah. little dude fish. Little dude. <laughs> yeah. Little dude. Uh do you have a favorite Disney damsel in distress, Katie? I well, I like Rapunzel's story, but I then am the opposite where I like the opposite way where I really like the tangled version that like gives her more personality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um I like that one. I do remember loving Sleeping Beauty when I was younger, but that was more just because I loved Philip like so much. Mm-hmm. But then it I did find it weird that even when I was that young watching it, that the movie's named after her, but she's asleep the whole movie. It's really his movie. So yeah. you know It should have been called Philip. <laughs> It should have. It really, well, that's really the should story. have. It's the story of Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> the story of Sleeping Beauty, yeah. It really is. And then I also remember Aladdin being like a huge favorite in my house. Mm-hmm. Um, just because yeah. that soundtrack is just like right right there. But Jasmine in that movie is like enough outspoken and she is, you know, still that mm-hmm. fighting back and I'm not going to do what you say. Like that's, I think, a good balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those would probably be like some of the top ones. Yeah. I got to say, because I feel like we're like, I feel like this is a safe space we've established for some things. Jasmine in that hourglass at the very movie, a very end of the movie, really should have clued me into the fact that I wasn't straight. Yeah, it was the red two piece. Yeah. It clued me into the fact that I blue. was. Oh. Damn it, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> there was so yeah, many that- things in my child. I'm like, <laughs> I knew I was straight from like seven dude that's for me (laughs) yeah i always had like a weird like affinity for that sequence but i wasn't sure why but also like that leans into me being ace is like yeah you're getting this but it's not connecting with the other things to give you a clearer message of what your deal is little child so just read your books (laughs) you'll get to it eventually (laughs) fair fair yeah i don't know what clued me in i know that like a lot of the you know communal internet's I'm straight because of Kovu in The Lion King 2. That wasn't me. My no. siblings were very much like, yes, Jack Frost in um, Rise of the Guardians or mm-hmm. like Eugene in Tangled or mm-hmm. um, Hiccup even in the second How to Train Your Dragon movie. How to Train Your Dragon, yeah. yeah. My sisters were like, yep, I was always like, that's a cartoon character. It was a bit weird. But <laughs> I grew out of that fairly quickly too though. But I was more like attached to like – book characters where they don't have like a picture of them <laughs> don't have a picture i could just they they are like this like they exist in the ether they're not a yeah. person they are a concept they are a feeling exactly, mm-hmm. mm. exactly. and then because then i can like take parts of them that i like so like peter and finnick both two different characters in the hunger games but if you could like put your hands together me i would like thanks <laughs> <laughs> and do you and does that do they get all of the trauma or half the trauma? Do you want quadruple of the trauma? Or Look, we can cut that out. I'm not one of those girls who's like, I need a broken boy so that I can fix them. That's not me. Because <laughs> they can be I, fixed. I'm lazy. I'm not putting in the hard work. Actually, you can fix yourself <laughs> and then I will mm-hmm. take credit. I'll take credit. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. yeah, but you can do all the hard work. That's very Elizabeth Darcy of you and I respect it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's just my unwillingness to get off my ass really. <laughs> I just want to sh- like because I'm on obviously I'm on the TV tropes. Just going through yeah. again, um, and this one is just funny to me. In okay. Toy Story and Toy Story Two, Andy purposely has Bo Peep play this role so Woody could save her. Not that she minds. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> and it's I super. Love that. And it, yeah. the not that she minds is hyperlinked, and where it goes is to sickeningly sweethearts. <laughs> 
I was so worried about where that hyperlink was going to go. I wasn't prepared for sickeningly <laughs> sweethearts, but that's what, yeah, that's what Woody and Bo yeah. are. And yeah, it's very cute. It's I love that great. that's the role that Andy made Bo play. But then in the context of all of the Toy Story movies, like, oh, Woody's the dude in distress. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> true. Every true. time someone's got to go. Kill all Woody. the time. Yeah. Oh, it's so, yeah. I, I like. Well, Buzz I mean, was I mentally think... the dude in distress in the first one. <laughs> Oh, yes. big time. That guy was big going time. through it. He was going through <laughs> it. <laughs> I think when I, the, the, the aspect of that damsel in distress trope that Bo just underlines is that it works for me when the person in distress is happy to be saved by that person. Mm-hmm. I don't really like enemies to lovers when they don't like having to be rescued by X. I don't actually really like enemies to lovers in general. Like, that's just not my jet. Je- oh, I fuck okay, with so a I good enemies to lover. I fuck yeah. with a good. It's it's a difficult one to pull because then it's kind of Stockholm syndrome, but I fuck with a good enemies to lover. <laughs> um, favorite trope actually. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm. It no. was not my intention. No. I was not trying to. I'm not trying to start anything. I'm so sorry. Please no. forgive me. I had no idea. <laughs> no, no, no. I like enemies to lovers because there is a certain amount of respect there from both sides. That's like, yes, you are actually like my equal in the fact that I hate you so much. Mm-hmm. I, you know what? When put like that, I do like that a lot. Just that you have yep. to respect. Okay. Yeah. No, that works. I like it more than like a friend still lovers. That one I'm like, yeah. I have problems with that. Yeah. Academic rivals still lovers is also. I, I'm still into lovers. childhood yeah. friends, went distant middle school or high school, and then came back in touch and it just clicks again. I'm into that. Yeah. Big that fan of that me. trope. Mm-hmm. See, that's one of those ones where I'm like, yes, I'm into it. But if that happened to me, I'd be like, why did you like me before that? I don't yeah, Because well, you, in middle school, that's no. Your red, yeah, your red flags, <laughs> obviously. Clearly, <laughs> but I, I'm still into it. I want to talk about, so like the general consensus is like, I don't mind the damsel in distress trope. I just don't like it when it's like used all the time. When it's always a damsel in distress trope. And that's the only, when the female character only exists in a narrative to be damsel in distress. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's a problem because it, it, I think the thing we see when these tropes become like troubling and lazy is when you have these original ones that were incredibly impactful. I would say Perseus saving Andromeda is incredibly impactful mm-hmm. and how quickly that can get turned into something tiring and demeaning. And so I'm going to go ahead. I put it in the notes. I said, do I want to talk about this? We'll see how I'm feeling. And I decided, yes, I do. I'm going to talk about Gwen Stacy. <laughs> Not. Spider Gwen, not Ghost Spider. I'm talking about the original Gwen Stacy of the Marvel comics. Peter Parker's first serious girlfriend in those stories. Yes. And famously dies. That she does. It's sometimes a vulture, sometimes a green goblin, but she's kidnapped. Spider Man goes to save her and he fails. Depending on the story, sometimes. She gets dropped and Peter doesn't catch her in time. Sometimes he does catch her, but the impact of it and caught by the web breaks her back. But the outcome is the same. And because it was she was going to hit the ground like too low to have ship. So and and that when that happened in the story arc called The Night Gwen Stacy Died, that was the first time that had happened. It's a bit like spoilery of a title, no? They here's oh okay, here fun fact. They didn't release the title until after she had died. They didn't say oh. what the arc was called. No, that's yeah. good. That's good. Mm-hmm. Nice. Because it was a huge deal for a hero to fail. Like hero girlfriends were damsels in distress. This happens pretty commonly. Class. But they always get saved. They always get saved. The hero will win. And for Gwen Stacy, this like longtime character in the comics, Peter Parker's love to die like that like that was shocking and that led into exploring like what happens to a hero when they fail when they lose someone like what does that do to them and that made for a very interesting like storytelling opportunities that very unfortunately just got copied and pasted into other fridging of female characters superhero girlfriends for the following 50 years because the other storytellers the other like they didn't recognize why that worked it wasn't just oh kill the female character for a shock punch it was like now we're going to tell a bigger story about tragedy and so i think the damsel in distress trope is like that it can be used effectively it in itself is not inherently bad mm-hmm. let me just come out this comes out in august okay i can talk about this this is like a, i was going to talk about taz uh the adventure zone real quick and it's very spoilery and i didn't want to spoil it for my girlfriend who listens but she will be all cut up by the time this episode comes out so <laughs> it's like in the adventure zone one of the it's a dnz podcast 
for those who don't know. Uh, Me, I'm the one who doesn't know. Oh, you don't know. Okay, okay, so this is a D&D action (laughs) play podcast. Uh, One of the the player characters, Travis, his character, Magnus Burnside's big motivation is that his wife died, right? That's Mm -hmm. that's a huge thing for him. And so that's like, oh, you know, bury, or, you know, fridge your woman trope. Oh, male character motivated by female character's death. Okay, whatever. The thing about that is, Travis has talked about how he based the character Magnus's wife Julia off of his wife, who changed his life entirely, and he says like made him a better person. That the wife Teresa, she is still alive, she's fine. But when Travis was young, he's like early twenties, his mother passed away from cancer. Mm-hmm. So he took these two things that happened in his real life, like and like kind of like combined them into this character motivation. And so I would argue that these kind of tropes that have a really bad reputation now aren't inherently bad in itself when they are being employed in like very real, very honest storytelling manners, right? Like it mm-hmm. doesn't just have to be, oh, you know, the girl gets captured and she's got to get saved because she's just a girl. It can be, hey, this character who this this character loves this other person so much. What do they do when they are in danger? What does that look like? What does loss yeah. do to someone? What does heartbreak do to someone? Yeah, that's good. I like that. Thank you. I definitely <laughs> on the on the note of like, well, heroes failing. I think it can be, as you say, very good, but when oversaturated, it starts to lose its meaning. Yeah, because it's it's fucking. It's kind of nice to see someone fail at times, and it builds mm-hmm. character for the superhero. I know I can relate this to Invincible somehow, but I don't have it. You're really trying. I can see you're like really looking it's to really pull. going for it. And I know it's there. I know here's the thing. Mark has failed. Mark has mm-hmm. failed so many times. And most of the time when he's failed, he got put into like a coma for six months at like Damn. one time. And like then That's he got locked into a fuck uh, he got locked into a fucking time ass uh distortion for five years this shit is dude this shit goes hard anyway he's failed damsel in distress sometimes it's his wife fuck (laughs) it's actually kind of interesting in invincible i don't think amber was ever used as the damsel interesting it was his literally superhero girlfriend Mm -hmm. mom makes a lot of sense yeah it was his mom and man that was a scary arc (laughs) Ooh. That was a very worrisome arc. I'm like, I was on the edge of my seat reading this shit. Anyway. (laughs) I found that to be a very like creatively and intellectually satisfying conversation. I want to thank you both for participating in it with Mm -hmm. me. Now, do you want to make some jokes? Uh, I would love to. About what? Make some jokes. Oh, just about like uh, damsels in distress that we like in pop culture. Like, I, I don't. Let's just we can just list and talk about ones we like or goofy ones. Does anyone else have? uh, All right, real quick. Yeah. This is a dude in distress. (laughs) Because in the game Spelunky, I didn't know this about this game, you can okay. go to the settings and change the damsel in the distress that you're saving to a half-naked buff dude. Mm, good. <laughs> and I think it's just fun. You should always have the options to swap things out for your preferences. Good for video mm. game. Good for Spelunky. I really want to talk about Fiona from Shrek. Yes. Yeah, that's a I good one. I just think she's a great, yeah. She's a great okay. example of a good subversion on this trope. Yeah. And they tell it both ways, too. Like, mm-hmm. she gets saved and she saves herself. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, having both ways. And I, I do like that because she's literally, like, playing this role specifically, like, she's, like, like as a role. Like, she knows this is the way the story goes. I need a prince to kiss me to break this curse, so I will do the thing that princes love, which is saving a princess from a tower. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Patrick doesn't. He's doing this shit for a job, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Wake up as he shakes her. <laughs> We got to go. There's a dragon. We got to move, dude. <laughs> but then I love, like Katie said, like she does his name herself, especially if uh, in Shrek 4, mm-hmm. where Shrek's never born, we do see if Fiona had left this state of that tower much longer, she was just going to be like, fuck it. I'm out of here. I'm just going to get out of here. Like I'm done. Yeah, I'll save myself, dude. I've been here for 20 years at this point. I got to do yeah, something else. Too long. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and then look what happened after. She started a fucking revolution. She started yeah, but she an was so revolution. much less happy. <laughs> it's very true. But also the whole Until world Shrek was so much her. less happy. Oh, yeah, this whole world. Rumpelstiltskins was a monster, but... Yeah, the whole world was... Uh, did you want to do a sideline into your favorite thing, which is how a true love so, kiss doesn't work if they don't remember each other? Yeah, Darian pointed this out like a while ago. I think it was... What movie was it? The Enchanted? 
I don't remember. Maybe. <laughs> there a movie where a princess forgets and I oh know it was like some early Disney movie, I think, or whatever. But uh, it's like the princess forgets and only true love's first kiss will break it. And then the true love who was the true love before the spell comes by kisses and it breaks it, which is not how memory spells and true love would really work because mm. love isn't innate. <laughs> It definitely changes and it grows and you get to be a true love by getting to know somebody. Mm -hmm. And Shrek does it actually superb because the whole like, well, Shrek knows that true love's first kiss will break this shit because he's no longer born. He's got to fix it. And so he's got to go kiss Fiona. He finds Mm -hmm. Fiona. He's like, well, it's true. And then Fiona pulls him in for a kiss and nothing happens. He's like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't work because I'm not your true love. And then goes about the business. And then the end of the movie, when Shrek gives sacrifices himself to save fiona fiona kisses him and it reverts the spell and you're like ah that's great that's amazing shrek forever after gets a little too much hate for my liking no here's the thing shrek forever after i think is actually a solid movie it's one it's the third dude (laughs) the third it's because it's called the third one which is a bad movie bad Mm-hmm. Speaking of Shrek 3, which is in fact a bad movie, and I will not hear a counter argument no, no, no. to that. There will be no Shrek defense in this podcast. There will be Shrek uh, 3 defense. Shrek the third Shrek is ass. I will defend right, Shrek right, 1, right. 2, and 4. Right. My bad. I misspoke. I misspoke. Uh, but there is a sequence of Damsel in Distress where Fiona, her mom, and then all the other princesses are captured and thrown in the dungeon. And the other princesses are like, all right, ladies, assume the positions. And they just assume their fairy tale positions to wait to be rescued. <laughs> That is, in fact, the one scene that I was going to counter. It like yeah. counteract so, your, your yeah. statement. That shit is good. The, it, that shit is good. Scene. That's yeah. what I was going to say. That that is very good. And I, my brain sometimes I think it's in Shrek two because no, it's, it's so not. good, but it's not. It's, it's in not. Shrek the third. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I also I do like the scene with um, Merlin at his campfire. I do also like that scene just because like the awkward song starts playing through the like the ring camera crystal thing. Uh-huh. I do like that scene. <laughs> It's like so random. Dude, this shit is stupid common in pinball. Damsel in Distress is very common in pinball. In pinball? In the in in the arcade game pinball? I don't know if you've I don't know if you've ever actually like sat down and played a pinball. No, there is like someone saved me from this game. You know how there's the screen on the pinballs? Like especially newer ones. There's literally a story that you can play and beat on most pinball machines nowadays. What? This no, it's it's insane and it's stupid fun and it's like there's a game called medieval madness and there are five princesses that you have to save that's so many there is something wrong with this place culturally if five princesses are in distress yeah and it's like obviously you got a spider-man so you got mj you got a Mm -hmm. princess beast for the mario bros and then just like April and Neil for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mm-hmm. And then just April. like a bunch of like, you know, a OC pinball machines. Oh, Kristen Day for the Phantom of the Opera. Hmm. Neat. But yeah, p- it's stupid common in pinball. <laughs> That's wild. I pinball is this. super fun when you like realize, oh, there's a story and there's a reason behind the flashing lights. This is great. And pinball becomes infinitely more exciting and fun when you realize that that's what's actually going on with this ball. I feel like the secret to pinball being fun is being good at pinball. Oh, dude, I'm not even good and at pinball. And getting to play longer than 90 it. seconds. <laughs> yeah. That's just, fun, that's so just, pra- like really that's just practice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Katie, did you have any doubt you wanted to tote out? I have a really silly one that's a dude in distress that Please. is – endlessly hilarious to me it's just ken in general in the barbie universe yes (laughs) but specifically ken in i think it's a fairy secret (gasps) which it's definitely like an odd movie there was a point in covid lockdown where my sister and i watched every single barbie movie over the course of like six weeks and i don't think i've ever been more brain dead in my entire life (laughs) and so like very limited like this is what I remember but something happens and Barbie finds out that she's a fairy or that fairies exist or something and Ken gets kidnapped and she has to go save Ken from like the fairy kingdom and I was he, like, Ken is kidnapped yeah. by the fairies oh yeah. that's that's so good that's like early authorian lore Barbie's got to be the warrior king go save from the yeah. fair folk ah I love and that he gets kidnapped fun. he gets kidnapped by the fairies and then like it's because he is just Barbie's boyfriend or something, and one of them wants to be 
Barbie's boyfriend instead. And so they're like, got to take out the competition. Just, just got to get him out of the way. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. And it is very funny. So I love that. Nice. And just Ken in general, I'm very excited for the Barbie movie coming out this year. Um, I yep. just feel like he embodies that role so much. Yep. Uh, by the time our listeners listen to this, the Barbie movie will have come out. It has been a cultural smash success. We are all wearing Barbie pink at all times. It is the international <laughs> uniform of humanity. It we'll is. See. It is. Barbie's take it over. She never yeah. left, really. She never left. Where did Barbie go? I want to talk about Roxanne Ritchie from Megamind. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> that wasn't what I was going to do, but that's another good one. <laughs> oh, so good. Just how... Megamind is just an actual masterpiece. I'm sorry. Oh, Megamind is a <laughs> like, on a, on a, I don't fantastic. think there's a single thing I could say, like... Maybe the city, like literally, the only thing that was ever brought to my attention is the city's a little bland, but it's a city. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's How very generic. How dare you city. slander it, atrocity? How dare you? Metrocity. It's dude. All those buildings are the exact same color. <laughs> we see the slums for like <laughs> one all scene. The same color in a city, kind of. They're all I gray. Mean, They're all not, not like, entirely. <laughs> not I mean, not to the extent of Mega Man <laughs> or Mega Mind. That's true. I mean, not every place can be Gotham. Yeah. <laughs> but if you I showed know. me a picture of like Star City or where is Superman from? Metropolis. 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 Thank you. Metropolis. I know I was confused. I was like, not, <laughs> uh, I don't think I would be able. You could just show me comic book panels and I'm pretty sure I'd be like, those are the same city. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, That's yeah. what they look like in comic books. But no, I love that. We, when we meet up with Roxanne at the beginning of the movie, just getting kidnapped has just become the thing she that happens. And she's just so old hat, like, oh, yeah, piranhas, lasers. Mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, totally. You're pretty you're, crazy. It's not pretty crazy. Oh, the spider's new. Yeah. And then we get to see her actually scared with Titan. Yeah, she's like, hey, hold up, wait. Like, wait. I don't know this villain. I don't yes, know this villain. That's the thing. She knows Megamind. She's not, she's like, I know this. Like, I Mega, know this Megamind's thing. doing this for the show. He's he's literally like, he's a showman, mm-hmm. okay? He's just but, in a silly but goofy. But Titan, yeah. Titan's scary. It is about presentation. <laughs> it is about presentation. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. And Titan's the biggest, like, incel fool who, like, thinks, like, Megamind's kidnapping. It's not even about Roxanne. It's about just fucking with Metro Man. But yeah. when he when like titan kidnaps roxanne it's in part like about her and mm. that's what makes it very scary yeah yeah no it's but. it's oof. Mm-hmm. the movie is just a cinematic masterpiece dude like Such a it really movie. it really is mm-hmm. dj you had someone you wanted to throw i in. did so we talked about it earlier off the podcast super princess peach everybody mario oh luigi and toad God. are captured by <laughs> bowser's army of elite hammer bros it's up to peach and her new ally perry to rescue them and she does it through the power of her emotions perry is a parasol the talking parasol that helps her harness that in fact uh, yeah. helps her harness the power of her emotions it's super fun fact mario seems to get kidnapped quite frequently actually <laughs> Yeah, Unironically, uh, Luigi gets kidnapped in the Super Mario Galaxy games. Mario gets mm-hmm. uh, kidnapped in Mario is Missing and Luigi's Mansion. All yeah. three Luigi's Mansion games. <laughs> Just super funny. Well, I don't think Luigi has any friends. <laughs> he might, like, but we don't get to see really him cool. outside of the Mario. Like He won a contest for a mansion, but clearly that was also staged to try to get Mario to come check to it out. Mario. Yeah, yeah it which is Mar- su- it's not even a- that's so sad. It's not even about Luigi. It's all no, it's Mario not. But Luigi, it. here's the thing Luigi is brave sorry, is as shit. Super Everyone Luigi? always. Well, Super yeah, Mario. It's Luigi's Mansion. Yeah, no, but, but the series about Super Mario. Super Luigi, you exists, okay? I don't want to hear it. <laughs> and it's, it's actually a harder version. Uh, it's actually a harder version of New Super Mario Bros. U than. <laughs> Well, New Super Mario Bros. Zero. It's really funny. But yeah, Luigi is... Everybody always calls him a coward because he's scared, but he's still doing it. He's still right? doing he's scared. it, yeah. It, that, that's bravery. That's courage. He's the bravest one out of everybody because he's he might be terrified, but because his brother's there, he's got to save him. I will give you that, yeah. All right. Katie, did you have anyone else you want to throw? I imagine we're getting to the point where this listing things won't be as fun, so... I can't think of any more off the top of my head that aren't like Disney movies, but mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I wanna I wanna shout out the princesses in Adventure Time real quick. Oh yeah. 
because I think I think the early premise of that series is like you have all these princesses and they're just kidnapped and in distress at some point in time, and Finn and Jake have to go save them. But as the series progresses, each of those characters becomes like a fully realized oh, yeah, character in her own right and have like it's also it also helps things. that the person kidnapping them is like ice king and he just starts yeah. doing other things she's like oh, who cares? yeah I, he, he picks up new hobbies <laughs> he, he picks up new hobbies like i think there was one is like dude you, you gotta do something else you can't keep stealing princesses like i don't know what else to do i was like figure it out <laughs> figure it out and he does he goes he goes and fucks off for like a whole season <laughs> a whole season doesn't kidnap a single princess and then he still does it cause, just because he's like going through the motions but he doesn't get anything out of it anymore. <laughs> He's like, mm-hmm. uh, there was the time he did kidnap everybody in order to read Fiona and Cake, and then Marceline, fu- Marceline fucked with him. That was so that was funny. Fun. I love that. that. Fun. She's like, no, 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 let me tell you this. And he's so mad because everyone likes her version better. Get out. Get out. All like, of that you, get is out. Truly, that is truly how, <laughs> that is honestly, I think how you as a writer feels when someone rolls up and is like, oh, well, here's my story. I just came up with off the bat. And everyone's like, that was so good. Get the fuck out of here. All of Please. it. I don't want to see any of you ever again. Please. It's great. <laughs> it's great. I love it a lot. I did think no, of I'm... one more. Please. Mm. Um, Lizzie Swan in the early, early, early Pirates of the Caribbeans. But then I do like that mm, she then yeah, becomes yeah. the king of the sea. She becomes king of the pirates. Yeah. Luffy, yeah. eat your heart out. <laughs> Literally. Literally. Oh, yeah. Speaking of Luffy, Nami in the early season west bay with arlong she's not technically kidnapped in that situation but she is kind of held a for like 20 million belly mm-hmm. and then she oh it's the one of the greatest scenes throughout the whole thing is luffy is lit, like letting nami kind of handle it she's part mm-hmm. of her crew but did kind of stab his back it's like all right well nami says she can handle it so she will and up until this point luffy had not stepped in right he's just mm-hmm. been like doing his own luffy thing uh, and then at this point, Nami is breaking down and looks at Luffy, tears in her eyes. Luffy, help me, please. And Luffy's like, all right. And he goes and kicks Arlong's ass. <laughs> it's I don't mind that. the greatest. You know, I was not expecting this episode to be us being like, actually, damsel in distress trope, not an inherently bad thing, but I'm so glad oh, that's I love the it. conclusion it's great. we've created. Yeah. Can I've be useful for storytelling. Great. Very true. Just don't Very overdo true. it. Just don't overdo it. It should yeah. be every time. If it's yeah. every, then you, 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 listen. Unless it's Mario. It's the privilege. Unless it's <laughs> Unless Mario. It's Mario. Kidnap, <laughs> kidnap Mario every time. <laughs> well, like, like, Prince Peach is kidnapped almost every time. <laughs> well, Except for Peach, maybe it's like Rosalina. three. I, yeah, and I think the, uh, the time that it's not, and it's not Rosalina either, is in fact uh, Super Mario 3D World. And it's just a bunch of like these fairy things. It's okay. a lot of fun. It's a you great time. And you get to play as Peach in that somehow. game too. So Nice. So I had one more actually pretty important Andromeda thing that I for some reason put under miscellaneous thoughts instead of like mm-hmm. up above anywhere else. With um, all the Princess Andromeda stuff? Yeah, I don't know. I Anyway, so just real quick, we, should, I just, we don't even have to like really dive into this, but I feel like there's something just we need to acknowledge briefly. Um, as I mentioned earlier... Andromeda is explicitly from the country of Ethiopia, which is in Africa. And you probably wouldn't know that if you had looked at literally any image of Andromeda where they paint her as the whitest white woman you ever did see. Yeah. So just acknowledge that, everybody. Just there There's it a is. galaxy That's... named after her. Oh, there. <laughs> yes, there is also the Andromeda. Are we in the Andromeda galaxy? But That's where we I thought we, we were in the right? Milky Way. It so says distance to okay. Earth. It says that it's 2.5 billion light years from Earth. What so galaxy is Earth in? What galaxy is the Milky Way eating? I love space. Oh, okay. You're right, DJ. This is the Milky Way galaxy and then the Andromeda yeah. galaxy. You know what? They just mentioned because it looks a like a Star Trek milk in and the I got sky. confused. Yeah. I, that's, that's why I remembered. I'm like, Andromeda, but it has something to do with space. What is that? I was thinking it was like the name of a ship. But the ship I was thinking of is actually not. It's named the Normandy. Mm, mm-hmm. Is that Alien? No, that's uh, Mass Effect. Mass Effect. Mass Effect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, actually, I uh, might be wrong. Dro- about you might be right. Hold on. I think, I think you're right and I'm wrong. I think Alien is something else. 
Yeah, Andromeda as just a, a name is used an awful lot for like things that are not related to Andromeda herself and even like thematically. And I think it's just because it's a good name. Like Tug Nostromo. Oh, is the commercial okay. space uh, tug Nostromo. Nostromo. Yeah, Nostromo is what I was getting confused with. Yeah, I think Andromeda is just a good name. It's a, it's a, it's a fun name. It like kind of it's one of those names that's like, yeah, I could see it being used in a spacey sci-fi thing or yeah. in the past. Yeah. It's got it's a timeless, you could say. Mm-hmm. Though if you have a character named Andromeda in the book, everyone's going to side-eye you really hard, so. <laughs> well, I think that is it, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us for this, uh, I will admit, rather wild and somewhat all over the place conversation. Thanks for coming along for the ride. Thank you for having me. This was very fun. Yay. Please, please tell our listeners where they can find more of you because they're going to want a lot more. Uh, so you can find the podcast on like any, well, I wouldn't say any podcatcher, but I know it's definitely on Apple, Google and Spotify um, at mm-hmm. the damn snack bar. We are a Percy Jackson podcast. So like that, and we're on our fourth round verse series. So that's, nice. um, yeah, pretty fun. And then if you want to find us on Instagram or Twitter, then we're at damn snack bar pod. And if you want to find me on TikTok, then I'm katie.damn snack bar pod. And Ooh. I do post some, 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 damn stack bar tiktoks on there but mostly it's just me being like oh my god i want to try this filter (laughs) so good links to all that will be in the show notes listeners you have no reason not to go and check out katie and all of her amazing work it's right there for you it's late (laughs) <laughs> thank you again katie for joining us listeners thank you so much for listening if you need more muses content you can find us over on patreon we've got tons of bonus episodes check it out patreon.com forward slash muses of pathology yep shit that we're really proud of really would like you guys to check it out and it's only a dollar to get the stuff that we're super stoked about that's well that's that's because dj's favorite thing we've ever done is the 12 part it absolutely is dude on- this shit's great and i i gotta say i'm already building the 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 list for the next 12 for for, for muse miss 2020 uh, yeah 2023 <laughs> yep i mean here's the thing there's a game that came out and i, I i'm gonna check I'm it sorry, out what oh goodness. there's a game okay. <laughs> i'm excited about it all right well listeners thank you so much we'll be back next week until then don't be like zeus don't be don't like be like zeus <laughs> Muses of Mythology is created and hosted by Darren and DJ Smart. It's edited by Darren Smart. The show is produced by Darren and DJ Smart, as well as... Tim O'Connor, the Crystal Con Man. Our music is Athens Festival by Martin Hain. And our cover art is by Audrey Miller. You can find her at on Instagram at bombshell nutshell art. Want more Muses of Mythology? Support the show on Patreon. Just $1 gets you exclusive bonus content. Get more at patreon.com forward slash muses of mythology. You can also support the show by leaving a review at lovethepodcast.com forward slash muses of mythology or tell a friend why you love the show. Don't forget to check out all of our episodes and episode transcripts at musesofmythology.com. Thanks for listening.